appears that we are live. So let's just wait for a confirmation from Aujan. Okay, still loading. Okay. Uh, okay, you can start. Ooh, here it is. Oh, we're gonna bring you two, roughly three main things in this debate. First of all, principle of, of accountability, why Twitter sh has an obligation to monitor at least to some extent, especially in terms of what its competition is doing. And two, we're gonna explain to you all the practical issues of why there's an asymmetry of like representation and documentation of political discourse on a platform, uh, especially because of the short format. And we're gonna explain why we got significantly better engagement and overall like significantly better discourse on the platform, but on the internet in general. A couple of like major points of framing. One, notice that Twitter's major, like Twitter and Facebook largely have a monopoly on online social media political discourse. Why is that? Just factual, you can take it as a fact of matter. I think it's fairly intuitive. The important bit of framing that really matters to this debate is Facebook has already committed to some extent to create a sort of court for itself that will evaluate content and that will filter what content is allowed in its platform or content is not. So first of all, Twitter not following that means that Facebook has the entire like has the entire uh, um, initiative to do whatever it wants without court and therefore set the trends for the internet in the future. So on the very first basis, we want a platform that is significantly more diverse. And as the, the prime minister said, like significantly more centered around discourse and less about around echo bubbles to also have a say in how like the internet is shaped. We believe that an alternative in which Facebook, Twitter had not done that would have been largely dictated specifically by the principles of Facebook that largely guard advertiser friendly content as opposed to the values of Twitter, which are like significantly catered and like treasured as a, a medium of uh, uh, free speech. So having that out of the way, they're going to have to deal with a comparative as to like, they do, that's, the, that's the kind of comparative they're going to have to deal with. Starting off with the first thing, accountability and why they have a new obligation. One, notice that Twitter as a platform has a certain amount of power, especially as a largely monopolistic power, uh, a monopolistic platform has a certain amount of power over what its uh, uh, like customers and what its users see. We believe that to the extent to which misinformation has the potential to harm individuals, and I'm going to go into detail as to what that mechanism is exactly in a bit, it is also complicit in all the harm that occurs thanks to its actions or inactions. We believe that to the extent to which like it allows mass spread of misinformation about uh, gain is being contagious, uh, like if we we, like give, give examples of early 2000s uh, Twitter to the extent to which all the harm that comes from the like change in minds of many people uh, like ex extributing from from this information is going to be to some extent on Twitter sense therefore all that harm that can be prevented is by uh, like by, by principal obligation must be prevented through those factors. But like second of all, I think this is and this is like the slightly more uh, important bit. Notice that there's already like some coverage of that principle, right? Twitter does ban hate speech, even though it's not directly obliged to by any particular government. Like Twitter does say there are limits as to how much of your free speech can do. And notice here, right? Because this is not something that is like outright direct causative relation, I'm spreading misinformation, therefore I'm harming somebody. We do not necessarily delete that content, but we still like uh, confirm our moral obligation to regulating it by flagging it and by allowing external sources to check and flag it. So moving on to the more practical ends of, uh, ends of this debate. I think there's a couple of important things to understand about the discourse, why discourse happens and how it happens on Twitter, right? First and foremost, notice that unlike, and this is something that completely topples everything Alex told you so far, uh, unlike uh, what his statement, people across the aisle have large amounts of coverage of what people on the other side of the aisle uh, uh, discourse about. Notice that this is something that's already contradictory in his own speech, right? He says people lack slugfest. Notice that on Twitter, when somebody wants to reply to some to uh, anybody else, the original comment is up there. The original posting is up there, which means that if I, as a liberal, see a liberal commentary on one of Trump's posts, I will also be able to see that little flag under Trump's post right there and there, which reinforces that the guy who I'm looking at is like obviously getting scrutiny. So the scrutiny is way, way, like very, very far from asymmetrical. In fact, and this is like the next important thing I'm going to go into in a couple of um, 
uh, seconds, but like the asymmetry is heavily favoring like very, very simplistic and often highly misinformative ideas, specifically because of the format. On the standard, it is much easier to say a false statement in 140 words than to say a completely factually checked, like scientifically proven statement in the same amount of characters. There's the same reason behind which like the right in general has significantly better means than the left, just because it's much harder to put like complex sociological theory into very, very short and concise uh, um, uh, bursts of information by and still do it justice, right? Notice that this means in general more simplistic and more like idiosyncratic ide uh, ideologies things that are significantly more like to be uh, um, uh, captured by demagogues and populists are have a much better breeding ground on platforms with the uh, like Twitter that have limited uh, amount of um <clears throat> amount of conversation space. Therefore, by introducing this policy, one, you significantly level the playing field and you allow more, like, and you uh, increase the scrutiny on those uh, outbursts as, as uh, uh, the leader, as the Prime Minister said, are like outbursts and um, just uh, thought flows. And that means that in general, posters are significantly more careful about what they post. This has two direct impacts. One, I as a poster, to the extent to which I expect at least some degree of backlash or at least some degree of like mitigation as to what my general uh, crowd of supporters believes, especially again, if we're talking about the moderates who are more likely to like start calling out Trump for his racist comments when they know they're factually false. Uh, and like, et cetera, et cetera, but also like on the left, same story there. Like, this means that there is an active risk for me to keep on lying and lying and lying blatantly, which means that at the very least, those blatant lies that can that can lead to the highest amount of radicalization of like uh, uh, um, uh, moderately, uh, moderately moderate uh, users is removed, but I'll take closing. Right. So your principle falls back into consequences at the point, it, like if ever you are unable to prove that Twitter is efficient at uh, uh, like making sure that those harms not don't really not moment. really for a couple of reasons one we don't have to stand that the system right now is like phenomenal but there are numerous mechanisms that are likely to improve it over time right notice that there's going to be massive amounts of scrutiny if the system isn't fair which is like likely to uh, which is already like to some extent being happening this means that twitter will strive in the future over like its future iterations its future uh, implementations and updates and so on and so forth to be as fair and objective as possible so that it does not like lose obvious political capital and does not lose uh, users to its competition. Like that's something that's fa uh, fairly intu intuitive. But again, notice on the second part that they have an obligation to try and act. Even if they fail, they still must do everything in their power to fulfill this obligation of mitigating harm that they are, uh, of, like, of mitigating harm that they might be collaterally responsible to. So to that extent, the principle stands. But again, on like getting back to the consequentialist part. I think the other very, very important thing to understand about engagement and why this increases engagement is one, there needs to be some degree of mutual respect between two parties in order to have this type of, uh, uh, in order to have this type of engagement in the first place. To the extent to which somebody is blatantly lying to you on the other side, and this is something that's completely unacknowledged by the party, you feel significantly more alienated by the, from the entire political process, but especially from the process of discourse itself. This means you're significantly less likely to participate in good faith uh, conversations on both sides of the house, therefore the entire foundation on which this course is based, like having the, the, the respect to treat your party as equal, to treat your, your opponents as equals, is gone. Thanks to this policy, we're significantly more likely to see less of that misinformation and therefore more of that respect that your opinion matters and that the platform does not sell blatant lies. For all these reasons, opening up. Thank you. We thank the leader of opposition. We are happy to call upon the Deputy Prime Minister. Here, here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Three, two, one. Okay, let me be very clear here. I think it is almost funny that Nicola thinks that, uh, you know, there is such a thing as good discourse on Twitter because it becomes very evident that Nicola has not used Twitter if that's genuinely what he thinks. I think what is what the actual characterization that he misses in Calix's speech is that when people see it in their own personal feed, it comes through the lens of the people they follow, meaning that the person that is being called out on their feed is already being shown as being wrong by the people they're following, meaning that that mechanism already exists because you tend to agree with the people you follow. People who have balanced Twitter feeds are already more likely to be critical and less likely to just accept whatever it is they happen to see on the internet in general, and therefore are less relevant to this debate, meaning that the impact on their side is rather marginal then because of, the, of how people interact with Twitter. And at best, they have very, and at very best, what they have left is that there is a principled obligation on the basis of the fact that sometimes 
false speech creates harm. Here is where we come in and we especially explain to you that we believe that the purpose of Twitter isn't supposed to be a place of facts, but is supposed to be a place of discourse. We are saying that similarly to how we don't put people or police officers or anyone else into the street, listening to all the conversations or all the things people blurt out into the street, into the marketplace uh, and fact checking that, Similarly to that, we think that this shouldn't be happening on Twitter because we believe that the, its primary purpose and the primary value it gives is the fact that it is open, unchecked uh, opinions of these people. We think it is good when Twitter says, when Trump says terrible and racist things on Twitter, not because we think it is good that terrible racist things are being said, but because everyone can see and point out all the terrible racist things Trump says. If their analysis is true and that becomes less likely, it becomes more difficult to point out the demagoguery of those individuals. That's, we think, bad. Additionally, however, we think that over time, we disagree that over time, this discourse just becomes better somehow magically, or this uh, policing becomes better. Uh, because one, we think that self-policing mechanism is in and of itself bad because it makes the primary purpose of that, not yet, it makes the primary purpose of that uh, of this uh, policy worse. And secondly, and more importantly, we think that over time, it's actually more likely to do what is best for their pocket because Twitter in the end of the day is a private corporation that has prim as a primary uh, uh, bias uh, basis to want to make as much money as possible. We don't think they are an actor that acts primarily on, under some moral obligation. They will start banning the speech that in their feedback most heavily generates the most amount of revenue and the most amount of clicks and the most amount of, gener uh, of uh, revenue generation in the end of the day. We, dis we don't understand why the fact that obligation exists means that company acts morally, especially American company. No, thank you, Gwen. I think then now that, uh, so let's talk then, uh, then le let's talk then about why we think our principle is more important. And this is the principle of open discourse, because we agree there exists a platform that already does all these things. And we agree that Facebook already does that exactly as Nicolas says, we think that's because people tend to see Facebook and Facebook also frames itself as a news company, Facebook frames itself as some as a place that wants to present people with what's going on in the world, very specifically, as opposed to Twitter that frames itself through a discourse platform. And we think it is good that Twitter is a discourse platform because we say, A, it enables the kind of disc, uh, it enables in real time a lot of people on, on the micro level to actually engage in these kinds of discussions and to be heard and to make themselves heard and also have the potential of bringing, of airing their grievances. But two, we think the thing, the idea of what the truth is, is in and of itself something rather malleable. We think what the truth is, is something that isn't just always inherently given. And also, even if the truth is ob obviously something, most people either already agree with it or aren't going to be swayed by a filter that says this is not true. The absolute vast majority of people aren't going to be convinced by someone saying that, you know, a, uh, a vaccines don't work. Those people who are swayed by that are going to be swayed by it, regardless of whether or not there's a filter on it saying this is wrong, because these people are already structurally biased to actually think ah, that's just big pharma influencing us through and policing our thoughts and shutting out the truth. And this is exactly why we say the, the benefit of this is rather marginal. The fact, uh, however, it limits the trust and the foundational ability of people to actually, from a, from the get-go, agree that Twitter is a platform that, generally speaking, allows this kind of discourse. It means that the kind of access from the get-go becomes lesser, and it means that fewer people are likely to actually engage with this platform in the way that it exists. What do we think the particular value of this engagement is? We say, first of all, when people actually uh, talk about things, the truth is more likely to come up. We say that through the mechanism of discourse of people calling each other out specifically and talking to each other, arguments are made because just like in debate, citing an example doesn't convince you. Similarly, we say that pointing out this was a false claim doesn't convince people. We're saying that the mechanism of persuasion is actually the mechanism of the argument. And we're saying that when these arguments happen fewer and fewer, then dogmatic views are more likely to arise specifically as a result of the mechanism that says fewer people engage in these arguments in the first place. This is the mechanism we want. We want more argument. We want more, call, we want more ability to call out falsehood actively rather than passively and not needing to Last engage. Chance to before, I, uh, before I uh, go on, I'll take opening.
Okay, like conviction is not a yes or no statement. It is a spectrum as to how much you're likely to believe that statement. To the extent to which that's true, you lose significantly more when you don't believe a specific statement because it's flagged by numerous other like. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 I get it. I get it. The idea here, again, is that what their thing rests on is that people see this flag and as a result, disbelieve what, uh, what comes after. As Calix has already explained to you, the people who follow someone on Twitter already think that person is right. They might rationalize that this was only one aspect that was wrong. They might rationalize this is the liberal left or the, liber or the fascist right trying to stifle them. We don't think that the people they want to convince are convinced by this tag. And that's the mechanism that's severely lacking, lacking in opening opposition's case. Closing government on the, uh, closing opposition tries to tell us, ah, but Twitter already bans uh, people who commit hate speech. Yeah, sure. Opening opposition also tries to tell us they ban hate, uh, they ban incitement. Note that these kinds of speeches that are currently being banned are the kinds of speeches we also ban in any other place in society. Generally speaking, we don't have laws against telling uh, lies. We don't have laws against not telling the truth. There is a difference between inciting someone to violence against another group of people and saying something that is wrong. We're saying that Twitter ought to operate under the same free speech principles as any other location and are therefore so proud to pro uh, propose. Ooh. We thank the Deputy Prime Minister for their speech, and we are happy to call upon the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Hear, hear. Ooh. Can you hear me? Cool. All right. So here's a problem with the characterization coming from opening government on our case, right? We're not trying to necessarily convince the radicals or the people who are on the right or the people that they are talking about, right? What we are coming to you with the case is that there are way more people who are being for, who are being fooled by this misinformation than opening government is trying to claim, right? They're trying to claim that sort of the most people are media savvy and can already weigh up different kinds of news sources and won't have any problem doing this. And this is really only about the people who don't do that. We stand against that completely. We say the group is much bigger than they think and this is much more harmful than they think. So first, a little bit of rebuttal. So basically the kind of group that they try to set up is a group that does some, somewhat uh, engage with other kinds of spectrums, but not that much that they can actually see those posts being flagged, but they are in their own bubble, but not that much that they would in their side of the house engage with other sources, but they, like it seems like a very niche group, right? We say our group is much bigger, why? We say there's a much bigger group of people who actually are fooled by this, by this, right? Why? First of all, because Twitter has become a news platform in a way that has been just incredibly big, right? Actual mainstream media sites get their information very often from Twitter because Twitter has become such a huge source of news, right? Because individuals have such an easy time and because it is so widely used to post things on Twitter, it has become much more of a news source than it is in the status quo, uh, than it is... Uh, than mainstream media is in the status quo, right? So we say there are much more people being fooled by this than they think. But second of all, we say a lot of people generally aren't media savvy, right? My mom uses Twitter. She doesn't necessarily know that things aren't fact checked, but my mom doesn't live in a right wing bubble, right? If she sees a tweet, for example, has some sort of fact check next to it, she is likely to actually click on that and think, oh, okay, well, I can compare these two things right now. I think it's not true that just the most people do that. But third of all, a lot of people grew up with Twitter as being a news platform, right? Think of, for example, Gen Z, but also even some, some people who are millennials right? They often grew up with that platform and they often believe that that news is true. I simply don't think that that group is so incredibly small and so incredibly ra radical, right? But fourth of all, what is the actual impact here, right? In your world, you have people who believe claims from politicians that they follow that aren't true, right? We can all agree, I think, that some things are factual, some things aren't without realizing that those things are true. On our side of the house, maybe they'll lose a little bit of faith in Twitter, maybe they'll go to a different platform, maybe they won't, but at least they have the choice to choose to either react to that, choose to react to the policy, to choose to react to that politician, or to weigh off those news sources, right? Which means we have a higher degree of autonomy, and it's really unclear to me why being distrustful of Twitter as a platform is a bad impact on their side, right? We think people being distrustful of a news platform might actually be good because they can actually do a little bit of their own research. Okay. So on to why we believe that um, being able to inform yourself is so incredibly important, right? So we say, 
thing to probably agree with is being able to inform yourself is incredibly important because when you make decisions in your life, whether it be voting, whether it be what kind of soup you want to buy, or whether it be what kind of what kind of school you want to send your children to, it's important to have the right information, right? And the problem with misinformation specifically is that you don't realize very often that that thing is misinformation, right? Which makes it different than, for example, emotions such as outrage or, or love or something else or values that decide your decisions, right? Very often you don't realize that misinformation is out there and that you are being misinformed, which means that the choice that you're making is being fundamentally misconstrued, right? Why do we think this is a more important thing to try to fight against as Twitter than, uh, than for example, the backlash, the, the political backlash, or as closing opposition, uh, closing government says, why we still think, even if Twitter does a bad job, this is still more important to do. So we say, first of all, because we would rather have people be distrustful of a platform than be completely trustful of information that isn't true, right? Because at least that gives them a choice to weigh off those kind of things. But also we say it's more important even if Twitter does a bad job because we think that at the moment that, uh, that Twitter has a lot more sort of manpower and research and ability to actually fact check these things, it's still going to be better on our side of the house than it will be on their side of the house where you just have a bunch of random individuals shouting things at each other and trying to decide what is true and what is not, right? So we say that is fundamentally different on our side of the house. But why do we believe that Twitter is likely to do a good job in any way? Uh, anyway, right, coming to our third point. The first reason is that Twitter is very likely to be very careful with flagging what is misinformation, what is not, right? They're very likely not to try to get into much of the political spectrum because that just looks bad because Twitter stands as being a very open, very political, very discourseful platform, right? So even though a lot of news comes from Twitter, they still stand as being sort of that open kind of platform. Therefore, uh, I'll take a few in a minute, by the way, OG. Um, they still stand as being a platform that, like that, right? But second of all, like sort of the idea that it's, I think closing government said sort of something like it's going to be very hard to do this. Look, mainstream media has been doing this for years, right? They fact check their own news. They fact check the things that they bring out into the world. We say Twitter is doing this in an even easier way because the only thing that they have to do is look at a piece of information and compare it with other sources and decide if it's true or not, right? That's actually, oh, fuck, my timer stopped by the way. So just uh, put the six if I have one more minute left. Um, but that makes it ah, thanks. <laughs> that makes it actually uh, substantially different from what, uh, what was I saying again? Yeah, from uh, mainstream media, right? Making it much, much more easier. But third of all, we think that sort of on the idea of political backlash as well, it is going to become normalized to some extent that people simply realize that tweets that have information in them are going to have a little link under it, which you can click on to go look and compare for yourself, right? We think for a very large amount of the population, this is simply going to become something that is normal. OG or CG, did you have the UI? Yeah, CG, go ahead. So the main right. way in which Bolsonaro talks to his supporters is not via Twitter, is via TV. How does that interact with your comparative? Like I just said, mainstream media already fact checks a lot of the things they do and already like, that's a different thing as well with Twitter, right? And that's sort of another point that I'm gonna make. Um, the power imbalance, right? On mainstream media, you very often have, for example, via TV, you very often have different opinions, but often, often different kind of, uh, for example, you have a politician from the right side or from the left side coming onto your television set, but also beforehand that person goes onto television, they at least to some extent talk with the presenters about what exactly they're going to be talking about, how they're going to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Twitter is just a press of a button and then it goes into the world, right? So the moment that politicians with very large followings and large amounts of power like Trump, but also maybe left-wing politicians or other politicians are able to just send out misinformation into the world and people can get that right onto their screen right away. It's very hard to kind of, uh, what do you call that, correct that misinformation uh, at that point, right? On mainstream media, it's much easier to do that. And I think that they do do that very much, right? So we say because Twitter has become such a, uh, I'm gonna check, I'm not sure. What time. Because Twitter has become such an incredibly huge net platform, they have a responsibility to prevent this kind of misinformation from happening, to prevent people from actually doing those things, and to prevent people from being able to not make more choices in their lives because they have the wrong information to base their choices on, right? So say because of the power of imbalance, but also because we believe Twitter is very likely to do a good job, to be careful with its responsibility, and because they simply have that responsibility to take that accountability, we say this is an incredibly good thing for them to do, and we don't regret it at all. We thank the deputy leader of opposition and indeed the entire top half of the debate as a whole. And to begin the second half of the debate, we are happy to call upon the member of government here, here. Can everybody hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Fabulous. Okay.
two points in my speech. Firstly, about why Twitter has perverse incentives and why it's likely to take actions that um, uh, decrease the likelihood of messages that are, for example, like anti-corporation, anti-corporation taxation, etc., to go out there. And, and and secondly, like resolving the top half clash on discourse and why they don't engage with the comparative properly. So in terms of perverse incentives, so we do hear some analysis out of opening government, but I think it falls to all of the challenges that we hear out of opening opposition and the ways in which I'll describe. But basically, so status quo, I think Twitter has uh, like um, it is problematic that Twitter basically has no accountability mechanisms on uh, on it to make sure that whenever they decide what is true or not, they decide properly. So firstly, Twitter is a corporation and its workers have a fiduciary obligation to increase the profits of the corporation at every point. If they do, if they don't do that, then literally like they're breaking a contract. But secondly, I think that anybody that chooses to work in a corporation like Twitter in Silicon Valley, etc., to a certain extent, like buys into a neoliberal mindset because they wish to contribute to that environment and they have no moral uh, like problem with, with contributing there. So I think it's very likely that a lot of the actions that workers at Twitter are going to take are going to be for the benefit of Twitter and to like uh, to ensure that profits are going to increase. But what about fact-checking corporations? So I think firstly, fact-checking corporations have to get their funding somewhere. It is just untrue that they're like completely not biased. Firstly, because like empirically that's just false or, or hard to be. Uh, but secondly, because they're much more likely to get their funding from neoliberal groups than any other types of groups because they just like empirically have more money because they defend the interests of the rich. Therefore, the rich are more likely to to, um, to give money to them as opposed to uh, any other uh, any other fact checking corporations. But also secondly, because status quo neoliberalism is the cultural hegemony. Therefore, that is the, the like ground zero, right? That is impartiality. It's to consider that corporations are legitimate to like be a big fanboy of Tesla and, and Google or whatever and think that taxing them is something that is uh, immoral. If you are in line with the cultural hegemony, you don't think that you are being extreme even though your beliefs may be so. Cool. So what changes at the moment where we apply the motion? I think that firstly, Twitter has the possibility to apply their bias to decisions about what is true and what is not. And they're going to have, as I have proven, fact-checking corporations that are willing to back them up at the moment where they have to put links uh, um, um, uh, below uh, tweet. So for example, they're more willing to call statements uh, which call for like increased corporate taxation or statements that say corporate taxation up until this level doesn't decrease uh, uh, jobs in the country. They're much more likely to see that as something that is false. Um, and, um, um, uh, and, and untruthful and to market as that. Um, secondly, I think that because there is no accountability mechanism, and by the way, opening opposition concedes to this and then knife themselves in their second speech by saying that actually, you know, people can choose to leave Twitter, uh, et cetera. So I think we agree with the, their first option, which is to say that you can't vote Twitter out democratically. We would be probably okay with like, or maybe uh, okay with the state doing this, but given that there are no accountability mechanisms on Twitter because it virtually operates under a monopoly type of framework, and you don't have any sort of democratic mandate over whether or not uh, it considers something that is legitimate uh, um, and, and, and truthful uh, as, as um as free speech, I think there is a potential for abuse there because literally it depends who owns Twitter, uh, what people believe to be true or not. And that is just a like a very dystopian, horrific environment to live in, but also it enables them to put, push for their uh, perverse incentives. Lastly, I think um, um, I, I think it's very likely that, because because currently, right, they're not doing anything like outrageous, but I think especially later on when the media stops paying attention because now like, you know, people are talking about this all the time, uh, but I think over time, like there's going to be new saturation so people are not going to want to hear about this so it's very likely that they're going to be able to update their their algorithm later on uh, in a way in which is going to benefit them and people are not going to care or hold them accountable and even if that's true boycotts don't work uh, um, just generally um, uh, mostly um, uh, because people have a limited attention span so they're less likely to uh, carry with that over a long term impacts. Why is that bad? Um, uh, why is this more precise than opening government? I think firstly, what we're saying is that we're likely to alienate right-wing centrists and label a, a, a center left-wing policy as being something that is truthful, that is outside of the ordinary, that is uh, that is not trustworthy. And I think in comparison to opening government, I think the majority stakeholder that we're, we're tackling are people that are much more likely to be persuaded by whether or not um, there is the, the false label, uh, mostly because they have like opinions that are like, um, uh, they have some like reason to believe 
believe the right, they have some reasons to believe the left. So like one extra reason in terms of objectivity is likely to swing it as opposed to their extremists that they talk about. Um, so uh, what this, look, uh, th uh, this looks like is basically, so it's not necessarily about the fact that people don't know the arguments for, for, for like left-wing ideology, but it is the fact that they're being labeled as extreme. They're being labeled as outside of the norm. They're being labeled as not truthful. Uh, maybe Bernie has like a platform to talk about like on TV about what his beliefs are. But if you go on Twitter and you see that he's been labeled as somebody that lies to you or you're less likely to hear him out, you're less likely to, to uh, consider the evidence that is being said there. Uh, opening government say a line about profit incentives, uh, but they don't tell you what the speech looks like or what it means or what its effects are on discourse. I think this looks like uh, less people going out to work for these politicians, less people willing to sign petitions. Uh, uh, and ultimately that means less money uh, for, for these politicians um, if, if, that go into like healthcare, uh, that go into social security uh, and increase people's welfare. Uh, before I move on, uh, closing off. Uh, yes, closing off. Yes. Okay. So internally, the decision to do this was super controversial within Twitter because it has people on both sides of the aisle and people who want to do this and people who don't want to do this. Why are they ever likely to go hog wild and not just stick to the most high profile and most egregious cases of misinformation? Uh, because like the side that did it won, right? There is no sort of guarantee just because there is opposition doesn't mean that the side that is wrong doesn't win, right? That doesn't help you in any sort of way. Uh, cool. So in terms of uh, discourse, resolving the top half. Firstly, top half just, I think that's, uh, they sort of forget that Twitter is not the main way that politicians still communicate status quo. Like there is, there are some lines of analysis in opening opposition about how mainstream media fact checks, but I think they're just empirically false. Like literally CNN like aired Trump speeches without editing for like hours on end. But I also think, even if you don't trust this example, which definitely happened, that is part of the reason why it won um, uh, the presidential election, I think they have selfish incentive to not antagonize, um, um, uh, like, um, I don't know, the people that they're fact checking, politicians, whatever, because they need to maintain a good relationship with them. Uh, and also because it's much better to not fact check because that then like allows you to put on um, um, like, um, um, like controversial statements that then increase your viewership, uh, et cetera. But I also think it's problematic when you look at low profile tweets, because I think like uh, there are a lot of like random influencers or like random senators that you're never ever going to uh, end up fact checking. And I think it's problematic because if they don't have the false banner, then you're much more likely to believe that those people are the right people uh, in, in, in lack of, of that being applied universally. Thank you to propose. We thank the member of government and happy to call upon the member of opposition. Hear, hear. Okay, am I audible? Okay. Two points of extension. Why we stop people from believing misinformation and why that's so important. This will take out top half. Secondly, how Twitter is likely to use its power um, and, to, and what they are likely to label as misinformation. This will take out CG. Okay. So I think what we have to acknowledge is that the vast majority of people in the world are not particularly politically engaged. They don't have a strong political bias and they don't have any one party who they are particularly attached to. Um, I think, so I th there are basically two reasons for this. Firstly, that education is just very difficult for many people. Even basic news articles on politics tend to use a lot of big words and tend to reference concepts and previous political events that people aren't familiar with. So it's hard for, for people to get their feet in the door. And secondly, most people, many people just don't care because most people just don't get how it immediately impacts their lives. The, I, just to give some empirical evidence that this is true, an, a study I read once said that 40% of American voters, and this is not the general American population, this is people who voted in the election, and so it is likely that the general population is even worse in this regard, 40% of American voters couldn't match liberal to Democrat and conservative to Republican, and more than 50% didn't know which party supported supports abortion rights and which party supports gun control. I think it is important to note how profoundly uninformed that most people in the world are. And so what this means is that it is a minority of people who are devoted to one side or another of the political discussion. And most people who in, who like see political discussions on Twitter are the people who actually kind of have balanced Twitter feeds the way that opening government describes. Opening government is completely wrong to say that these are the most media literate people. These are the people who maybe have some friends on both sides of the aisle, but aren't very engaged in politics 
politics either way. And so they have some friends who will retweet, uh, retweet conservative tweets, and they'll have some friends who will retweet liberal tweets. These people are very susceptible to any one piece of information that they get because they don't uh, have like a lot more information. And th this is, and this group is the vast majority of people who engage on Twitter. So what that shows us is that this group of unengaged people is by far the most important group to talk about and not the kind of discourse that opening government talks about. Most people don't use Twitter for discourse. Most people passively use it as a news source. Uh, I think opening uh, opposition talks about this group of people, but they, do, they don't do two things that I've just done. One, they uh, don't show you just how large this group is. And two, they don't show you why it is so important that these specific people not be exposed to misinformation or that when they are exposed to misinformation, it is clearly labeled as such because we think that these people without any specific political attachment are likely not to be angered by the misinformation flag. They're likely to just straightforwardly believe it because they can't, uh, you know, they're not exposed to any of the like ulterior motives that might be th uh, that like conservatives think are there for that being there. So why is it so important um, for this information to be labeled as such? Oh Opening opposition just says it's important for people to make individual choices. But even if you think, for example, that people are entitled to make their own choices about what information they receive, we think that misinformation being prominent has huge negative externalities on the rest of the population. How does this play out? For example, public safety in things like the coronavirus, people not understanding the importance of social distancing is enormously damaging to other people who don't consent into whatever kinds of misinformation are not being informed that you want to have. If you make a Bad choice and don't wear a mask in public, that hurts other people. That hurts people who haven't consented to that. We also think that this misinformation often tends to target minorities. It often looks like politicians demonizing immigrants with false statistics about crime, for example. Um, we think that when uh, you, that then these uninformed people have bad information about minorities and are more likely to treat those minorities badly in everyday life. They are more likely to do things like look the other way when they, they are facing racism, more likely to be casually racist themselves hurting those minorities. We think that this often, and the, the final one, is that it often is, misinformation is often used for voter suppression. For example, Trump will often tweet inaccurate things about what their requirements are in order to vote, in order to make sure that people on the left don't vote, and he knows that the people on the right will have filled out those requirements. This, this doesn't just hurt the people who see that misinformation, this hurts every other left-wing person who might want a left-wing politician elected who have been prevented from doing so. We think therefore that there is a strong imperative for the good of the world that outweighs the discourse because there are just less people doing it, but also opening government hasn't shown how the discourse impacts people's daily lives the way we have. It is in, there it is an imperative that w this in, in misinformation not happen and that these unengaged people who are really susceptible to this information not be exposed to it. I'll take opening. Look, at, your, at the very best, what you're showing us is that news sources should be very heavily vetted. However, what we are saying is that the vast majority of people just say things on Twitter. And just like we wouldn't want the state or anyone interfering in your personal speech, we similarly okay, wouldn't want this Twitter. That's 15. So that's actually a really great segue into my second point. When is Twitter likely to use their power to act and when are they not likely to use it? So recognize, as I flagged in a POI, the decision to introduce fact checking on Twitter was super controversial internally. They were debating about this for months before they finally did it because there were people who share the prime, uh, who share the deputy prime minister's belief that we shouldn't censor people's free speech. There were people there who were really reluctant to ever get in the way of discourse. And we think that large tech companies tend to attract both liberals and conservatives because you tend to have liberals who are attracted by the uh, by the like glamour of doing something new, the move fast and break things mentality. And you have conservatives who are attracted by the fact that it's a big business and they went to business school. Therefore, we think that the way that Twitter is likely to use this power is unlikely to ever get to the point that the ridiculous point that CG wants to claim, where they're just going to be labeling uh, like tweets by left wing economists uh, uh, as uh, as false because they go against neoliberalism. We think that that is really, uh, given the fact that there are people on both sides of the aisle toward the top of Twitter who would not want to see this go too far and they have to kind of agree on how the fact checking is used in order for anything to happen, we think that it is only likely to be used in one, the most egregious cases, and two, not used very often and only used in prominent cases like Trump and like other big politicians. So it's unlikely to actually harm any discourse because ordinary people will probably still be able to say whatever they want. It will only be the people toward the top who are censored. These are the people who have the greatest ability to spread misinformation, the kind of dangerous misinformation that I was talking about, but who 
who have the least to gain from actually being part of discourse. Um, I, so we, yeah, so what, the way I want to end that point is to say basically that we will only get the most damaging tweets, the things that are most clearly false. We won't get left-wing economic statements, even though they might be controversial. We will only get things like climate change denial or saying that coronavirus is no big deal. We will. Uh, those are the only things that are uncontroversially false enough to get both sides of the aisle to label them as false. And so we only get the important things labeled as false. I'm proud to oppose. We thank the member of opposition for their speech and to conclude the case for side government, we're happy to call upon the government whip. Hear, hear, woo. Okay, a few things in the speech. I'm first of all going to look at what closing government just brought us and then compare that what uh, Julie brought you and then going to look at um, opening half, uh, uh, opening half, weighing opening uh, government against us and then looking at opening opposition. So first of all, what did closing government bring us? First of all, they tell us the fact that like the, the, like the kind of the general idea we've heard across the, uh, uh, of, yeah, the, uh, op opposition bench of the idea that this is just going to give it a fake news. But I think the problem with this is that uh, just the fact that like within the wording of this motion, it very clearly says that this is about high profile, like high profile people and high profile things like the fact that they checked Donald Trump and like they haven't really uh, utilized this in many other ways. Like these are like large scale people. So when they have all these ideas that you're just going to get rid of fake news and you're going to get rid of fake ideas and like uh, stop the spread of fake information, I think like it's just important to note that a lot of fake information comes from like small alt-right accounts or like Russian bots or, or like extremists, or like extremist groups on the fringes, like left and right. Like I think most fake information is spread and perpetuated by these groups or like um, fake Republican um, Twitter accounts and things like that, right? I don't like, yeah, obviously Donald Trump tweets a lot of like garbage as well and fake news. But I think that the, um, that the like the important thing here is that this only really resonates to high profile cases, right? So I think that takes out a lot of what they are saying. But I also think that, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Then they then talk about like the fact that, um, it's going what is it's going what is going to fact check is going to fact check things that are like so beyond dispute that it has to be done and that everyone on both sides of the aisle will agree with it but note that pe like a lot of conservatives do just not believe in climate change right a lot of conservatives don't believe in coronavirus right a lot of like um like a lot of people on both sides of the aisle also downplay a lot of things that the other ones say are threats right um, I, so I like I don't like I think almost every single issue in the world can be politicized to some extent, right? So I think this is very difficult to actually enforce, right? And then okay, onto their second point when they said when it, uh, when Twitter is not going to use their power because it was so controversial. Um, but but like the point of uh, the reason that we the reason that. Um, we went over this case is that they say that Twitter wants to be apolitical because um, it because people within Twitter uh, like fight against it and like agree with the principle of discourse that uh, opening government brings you. Why did so? Why in the end will profit always win out over any principle of like free discourse? Right. The problem is is that. And then why are you going to get like um, the harms that um, Julie brings you? The problem is that that Twitter ultimately like their power belongs is in the board, which has to like uh, call, come back to its shareholders, right? And what do the shareholders want? They want money, they want interest, they want like Twitter to grow as a thing, right? So it's going to be within the shareholders' interest, and then the, for the board's interest and everyone on the way up um, to like promote things that are go against uh, that go against like things like uh, taxation of large corporations or monopolies, right? So this goes back to like um, Julie's first point, right? So to, the fact that Twitter has perverse incentives because the fact that also the problem is is that like it also has no accountability, right? This is not a government funded state thing like um, the BBC. This is not an independent fact checker or like a charity, which is also then accountable to the government. This is a, its own company. And also that comp uh, companies and uh, uh, corporations in America and like most of the world do have like have every right and like have every right to be as political as they want to be like Nike like um endorsing Colin Kaepernick or the fact that like a Chick-fil-A like gives loads to anti-LGBT um uh ch like um gatherings and things like that like corporations can be completely as political as they want to be right I think it is then in Twitter's incentive because they are pure, like driven by the profit incentive over any other um idea over any other principles that they will always then like when they comes to fact checking we're not going to say that they're going to like say that um like uh, a left-wing idea is completely fake but I think what they're going to do is they're going to be more stringent and more critical of things that on towards the left side which say that like um that corporations are bad and like these ideas I think what this does is this very like very gradually and slowly like I think this is a 
long-term slow impact it shifts the public narrative and shifts the per public perception i think like there's already like a good like this is already quite obvious in things like facebook ads and like uh for both the brexit vote and like the 2016 um US election, right, where Facebook ads were very carefully targeted towards people. I think it is then in Twitter's interest to then talk, like to make sure they fact check like the left wing ones, which are more critical of big monopolies than it is for them to fact check the right wing ones. I think that's what this looks like. Second of all, when we say like uh, the second point, the resolving the discourse of um, uh, top half, right, about first of all, we want to know that polit uh, politicians like, yes, they do use like things to tweet, but they also like um, use big like um, they, uh, they they speak on TV a lot, basically, and that is how it gets, gets um they get their message out to the majority of people within a nation because like everyone pretty much these days in the Western world at least has on a TV, but not everyone has Twitter, right? I also think that there's something else to note here. This both happens in both opposition uh, both opposition cases where they say that like oh we're going to get rid of fake news, but I think what happens is when Donald Trump tweets something absolutely ridiculous, I think what happens is people go wait the president of the United States is saying this ridiculous thing, right? And if, even if that is flagged uh, flagged up as incorrect or not, I think people are less likely uh, or more likely to look into it themselves because they're like this president says uh, this ridiculous thing, and so they're going to check that. But I think what doesn't happen under uh, their side of the house because this is only for high profile people is that you're not fact checking like the lower down down, like um, mayors or heads of or heads of state, not heads of state, um, like senators and people like that, or MPs. You're not checking. You're not doing those. Uh, you're not fact checking those people. And those people are, are like just as likely to say something slightly false. They are just as likely to give uh, spread this false information about both coronavirus or the fact or demonizing minorities um, or like immigrants. Like they are just as likely to do that because they are also within the Republican Party. And because also because they like represent you like within the government, you're also like just as likely to buy into what they say. Even if you don't buy into what Trump says, you can still buy into like another conservative platform, which is equally not as fact checked, right? I think also then the problem that opening opposition has is that they talk about how Twitter is a news source. Uh, no, they talk about first of all their principle about accountability. They talk about how Last like they have. You. Uh, yeah, I'll take CEO. Okay, your case can't be that there are other sources of misinformation because if something goes viral, then that probably counts as high profile enough for us to fact check it. Maybe we don't stop every little source of misinformation, but we stop the vast majority of the ones people see because they're either from big sources or go okay, viral. Okay, yeah, but there's still like then the arbitrary barrier of what counts as viral and what counts as like fact checking because something can reach 100,000 people, but that is not counted as viral because like, it, you know, something on the internet can reach literally a billion people. Um, so like, but then you're still 100,000 thousand people who have like either seen that or bought into that like there, there is no way down and there's just no way that like either twitter or google or facebook can ever go right down to the bottom and be like yes we have got every single thing and everything on here is true um or a fact checked right okay so very quickly onto the accountability point um uh, yeah um first of all i just think like i don't understand why this principle stands because for example as an intuition pump if i put up a billboard in my school uh, with the intention of people being able to put like posters about like animal rights on it and then someone puts up something saying like actually i think it's okay to kill like wasps or whatever Whatever. like that is not then my responsibility to take down the whole billboard it is not my responsibility to move that i just don't understand why that is the case if someone like uses uh, a platform that i have created uh, like in a different uh, way that i didn't intend second of all they say that um twitter is now a news source and that is why it has to be critical but i think twitter is only a news source in the way that actually the internet is a news source in the way that actually like mainstream media uses it to like send out its message and to broadcast and that is the way that it performs like most of the news you get on twitter comes from the twitter accounts of people like cnn uh, oh my, my timer's a bit off anyway so Sorry, uh, proud to uh, propose. Okay, so we thank the government whip and to conclude side opposition and indeed the entire debate as a whole, we are happy to call upon the opposition whip. Here, here. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. I'm going to begin with closing government, and then I'm going to go to opening government, and then I'm going to expand on our case a bit and explain why we're winning this round. So closing government gives us a few things. Their main point is about how Twitter has a fiduciary in, um, like interest to like act in like what makes them the most profit and what's the best for them, but they don't really get to what their impacts are. Why is that the case? One, because they're missing, like right now they have a fiduciary interest for to actually spread misinformation. Viral tweets are good for Twitter because they make them more money and attract more users. Misinformation tends to go viral because of the nature of how simple it is. And that's why it normally spreads so fast. Like tweets with like memes that are obvious lies, but spread really fast because they're just, 
they're easy to digest. So they actually currently have it, or before this, have a fiduciary incentive to allow this stuff to fester. In our world, now Trump has signed an executive order which says that if Twitter fact checks, they're legally liable for false statements or statements which can harm people. So now Twitter has a fiduciary interest to actually make sure that they fact check the things that are actually verifiably false and which could cause harm to society. The only, the only reason they have a fiduciary interest to actually act in the public good currently is because they fact checked false statements and incurred the, this executive order forcing them to now have legal responsibility because they're now treated as a publisher, which means that in their world, their financial interest is much worse than it currently is in our world. And also, they also don't get to the impact where they say that they're going to like fact check things which like harm left-wing ideas that might harm Twitter because as Gwen tells you in our case, the structure of Twitter does not allow that. In Twitter, the top, like half the top board people are super left wing, including the, the CEO himself, who himself doesn't like to get that involved in the fact checking process. This means that any fact check is likely to be a result of, bi of bipartisan discussion between the top pe um, in people in Twitter, which is why it took months for them to actually get to fact check in the first place. And so it's likely not going to be, we're going to fact check left wing economists who like oppose monopoly stuff. because. Currently, they, if their argument is that they're going to fact check anything anti-Twitter, then they would have been fact checking all the conservatives who say Twitter hates free speech, Twitter only censors the right, Twitter kicks everyone on the right off and no one on the left, and they fact check those right now, but they don't because they don't actually care about those. Twitter only fact checks when they see that there's a real reason to fact check because it could harm society or spread lots of misinformation. This means that you're only going to have fact checks on like high profile people or tweets that go viral. The closing government tells you that, oh, they'll look at all the people who are smaller and whose tweets don't get that many views. But that's exactly what we're advocating for. Like those people are not going to have a big impact on society. If their tweet somehow now gets big because people are looking at the small tweets, then it gets fact checked because it goes viral. Our point is that we're stopping most of the misinformation from spreading around and harming people. They claim that in response to fake news. Yeah, they say it's normally bots and stuff, but it's about the virality of tweets. And so we stop viral tweets and tweets from big people. But then they say that they, um, yeah, they say that um, fact checking corporations might be bad. This doesn't really make much sense. Twitter only fact checks sometimes. Uh, they try to, as Gwen tells you, they try to do it as, le as le least as possible. They try to do it only when it's necessary because they have a financial interest not to fact check too much because they might look politicized and they might discourage people from using the platform, especially conservatives. So they actually, this doesn't really apply. And the, the fact is, so there's no like, like men, malicious intent going on. In, Twitter is now going to use itself to like cause a bunch of harm. And, you know, even if Twitter did fact check, like every single tweet, which was anti-Twitter, even if Twitter did fact check every single tweet that they thought they didn't like because it hurt their financial interests, we don't care because we're preventing the biggest harms of the spread of misinformation and how it affects society. That's where we give you our second point of extension. And this is what we don't think the, the opening side gives you. Before I move on to opening opposition, I'm going to explain why fake news and the spread of it especially through Twitter is so damaging. Twitter, or, or actually I'll explain it on opening opposition because it actually connects why. Opening opposition tells you that Twitter acts as a free speech platform and that we should treat it as such. But however, it functions as a news platform because as Gwen tells you, most of the people who use Twitter are passive users who are not politically like strung to a single position or don't even know who these people are who are posting these things because they're not actually politically involved. Most people cannot name the positions of the candidates, don't know what the parties associate with. They might have strong political beliefs, but they have no idea who's saying what. So really, we're talking about a large portion of people who see their friends retweet things that they don't actually actively follow people who follow people but don't really like follow left-wing people and or follow trump just because he's like the, the president don't not actually because they support him like there's tons of people who like gain um, exposure to this information um who treat it as a news source and so and so it really functions as a news source and that's where it affects the public um and that's where that's why we should be treating it as such that's really important because it also doesn't function as a discussion court um forum because no one gets their opinions really changed on twitter uh, if they have those opinions coming into it. Um, at, it as a discussion, people who go there for discussion tend not to leave with changed opinions. They don't really give a mechanism for that. If someone, like as opening tells you, like people don't follow people of the opposite political party. So it's unlikely they're gonna actually change their opinion. Like they don't act, like there's no utility to Twitter as a discourse platform. And there's no evidence 
anywhere in society that it has brought about understanding of the other side. All Twitter has done to society is polarize everyone and act and make it seem like the divisions are sharper than ever. And so it really, we don't care how it acts as a discourse platform. We just care about how it affects society and specifically the news aspect of it and the, how information affects people and how that affects other people in society. That's where we give you the most important part of an extension. And that's why, so what does that look like? We tell you that there are many instances in which the news and the information people get off Twitter drastically affects the course of their lives or other people's lives. For example, public safety. In any instance of public safety, whether it be through like, uh, you know, terrorist events, whether it be through uh, pandemics, like the current one, we say that in, like accurate information is the most vital thing possible to prevent false narratives and people from acting or believing false things. If, like studies have shown that if, if, if people in the, like, the United States had the respected social distancing a bit earlier, like tens of millions of lives would have been pre prevented from being infected and a bunch of people would have lives would have been saved. This is the kind of instance in where the spread of viral false information and false tweets really affect society. And it also harms minorities and people who happen to be uh, affected groups already because politicians use this platform to like um, call them or like put like lies about them and like economic lies and blame them for issues on society, which further marginalize the most affected in, in societies in the first place. And you're only criminalizing or, or punishing people who are already at risk of being in danger. For these reasons, to pr promote the public good, we're probably oppo opposed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Woo. Okay. We thank think opposition whip and indeed all of the speakers in the debate. <laughs> Is everyone here or are enough people here? Look, you're all obviously technically in the room, but I just want to make sure because you know you're entitled to like go to the bathroom or whatever. Okay, great. I think we have at least one person from each team. Uh, so we can get going. Thank you for that debate. It was truly a lovely debate. I think uh, you did the motion justice. We kind of like it, so good fun. Uh, and the ranking that we ultimately ended up on is the first going to closing opposition, the second to closing government, the third to opening opposition, the fourth, unfortunately, in this case, to opening government. We'll explain the rankings as they went along. We'll start from the top half and then introduce the two other teams uh, going essentially from the fourth to the first, in this case, probably the most convenient way to understand that. So with with OG, basically, the contributions are that Twitter is unique. OG framed Twitter as uniquely a discourse platform, a marketplace for ideas, a place where people can discuss with one another and be affected. And they also framed that the people most affected by this are people who don't really have balanced feeds because these are people who are aware of fact checks and of fact checks in general. These are sort of like high engagement, but also high fairness users, but rather people who are a little bit more biased to one side. Therefore, the way that they mechanize backlash into, into, uh, into leading towards soft discourse is either by people leaving the platform or by people engaging with the platform with a, lot, with a lot less good faith or with a lot less of trust and belief. Then they, then what, what does LO introduce to that? So LO, make, LO makes two claims. The first is a principled claim, sort of accountability claim. How does that accountability claim play, pan out? We are shown that Twitter has an accountability to the content that it puts out. That claim is challenged on a few fronts, but if we think broadly, it stands to the end of the debate and in being quite persuasive. Unfortunately, the second part of that ought claim should be a proof of why then this specific type of moderation is warranted, uh, is principally mandated, or is warranted by that principle. I think, unfortunately, what, what sort of happens is that that principled claim is to an extent contingent on that being the right type of moderation or, or that moderation creating positive outcomes. I know it's something unfortunate that tends to happen to a lot of principled claims. We can discuss in feedback how to avoid that, but I think unfortunately that's what it came down to in this particular case. Then we get some practical points. So first of all is the idea that screening is somewhat sometimes asymmetric in a way that hurts uh, the side we like better. Do note that until you provide analysis for it, we are not inherently poised to think that the left is better than the right. It's quite important to pay attention to that. Uh, but then we get a lot of interesting things, I think, in 
DLO from that, which is a why Twitter would be able to do that well. Twitter is apolitical, it, it, it perceived as somewhat apolitical, is afraid of looking bad, wants to be an open platform, but also why that is possible because they'll use fact checking uh, agencies or fact checking sources, which are available in mainstream, uh, which have been around in mainstream media forever. And also this will be normalized. So the backlash is eroded a long time. The second claim that we get is about the people who engage with it. I'll do that claim down uh, both second speeches in a tiny second, but before that, just, just so that we're, we're all in one row. Uh, the, the other thing is the sort of harms that misinformation can, can have. So one, they sort of compare against the DPM harm that it is better to be distrustful than to be trustful of lies. Two, that and, and, and two, they characterize some populations that aren't exactly the populations characterized by OG, but are still quite uh, sus susceptible, is the word, susceptible to misinformation on Twitter. Those two characterizations specifically are DLO's mother, right, but generally older people who aren't media savvy, but also aren't a part of a right wing uh, conservative uh, Twitter bubble, and so might be uh, oriented to that. And secondly, people like, you know, Gen Z, who just rely on Twitter as a primary news source. Now, then that leads us into what I think is possibly the primary question, and that that's why I'm tying DPM in a little later, because a primary question here has been about whether Twitter is a discourse uh, platform or uh, a news source platform. So a few things about that and talking about what DPM does. So I think, first of all, the defense of the idea that it is a discourse platform rather than a news uh, a platform is mostly assertive. Now, I understand that claim intuitively. I am inclined to believe it to an extent, but I think DLO is able to refute it well by saying, yes, maybe the people in this room who are quite politically savvy perceive Twitter as a discourse platform, but numerically, here are these populations that are rather large that still rely on it as a news platform. So I think that is quite effective then in sort of at least in, in winning or at least slightly being more persuasive on that framing issue. And that framing issue becomes quite crucial because then that means how do we weigh what's more important, having truthful information or having healthy discourse. I think also a characterization at the top of DPM uh, somewhat slightly under under undermines claims and, and makes, makes a, a, a little non-strategic concession, which is that people see the stuff they engage with in discourse through the lens of the people retweeting it, which are people they agree with. But that unfortunately, I think, undercuts a little bit uh, the believability of some of the positive discourse mechanisms that PM has talked about. So ultimately, there is a certain judgment call to be made here, and on it relies the practical clash which determines the top half, i.e. we have to try to assess what is the larger population, the discourse people who are, will now either leave or be distrustful, and I am persuaded that them leaving is possibly not a good thing, or the news consumption people who are currently believing certain types of lies. This is a judgment call which to an extent requires us as judges to insert ourselves and determine what the average informed voter would say, but we do find the analysis and descriptions on opening opposition to be more persuasive on that account. From that, the rest of the clashes fall as I described. That is, we are persuaded that the practical harms that side opposition pre prevents are larger and that therefore the practical harms that peak that, that accrue due to fact checking are smaller from the rest of that, the rest of top half pans out. It's quite a close call, but we do believe that that is the right way to call it. Closing government and introducing them into this debate. So basically, two important things to note about what we just said about OO. One is that their principle is contingent to a degree on reality, i.e., insofar as Twitter is committed to defending truth principally, if CG can establish that what Twitter will do won't be to defend truth, then actually the principle is flipped, right? The principle is actually a reason to vote for side government. The second important claim here is that uh, it is to compare what uh, happens mostly in the DLO speech about the practicality of Twitter, uh, of Twitter controlling fact checks versus CG's case. So what is CG's case? CG's case is essentially that there is a certain slant that Twitter 
uh, that Twitter will take and that Twitter will pursue uh, because of its interests. That is, Twitter has some neoliberal, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of $10 world words and debating unless you explain everything that they mean, but uh, they, it has neoliberal interests, that is, and then we do get a couple of tangible examples like uh, low corporate tax rate and how it affects uh, growth, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so systemically, those will be things that sort of get fact checked. I will say, and, 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 and obviously to the extent that we accept that claim, that claim then beats OO because of what I just said about flipping the principle, but also because OO's analysis on, uh, on why Twitter will be good just sort of de depends on having motivations except for one link which says Twitter wants to be perceived as apolitical and avoid backlash. Then we get a lot of legwork done on uh, analytical work done on uh, why it's in the interest of Twitter. Twitter is beho beholden to stockholders. Twitter is profit oriented. These are the types of things that people don't necessarily get worked up about and also how that ties into negative impacts about the world. Less volunteering, less signatures, less support. Here I will also note as a minor like parenthetically feedback comment that it is not a universal good that Bernie Sanders is preferable to like Joe Biden, right? This is something that needs to be explained insofar as you believe it. Uh, then, uh, however, ultimately we see this as a claim that is somewhat less intuitive than the OO claim, i.e. it's not something that, as you, I think, wisely concede, it's not something that we've really seen already happen in real life. But the gap in the level of analysis and the amount of persuasive work that is done to persuade us that this will be the case, or at least that this is likely to be the case, is more than sufficient for us to be persuaded that these are the types of fact checks that Twitter is going to do. And unfortunately, that means that by OO's metrics, CG defeat OO. Okay, so that's the short diagonal. Hope that was clear. If not, ask any questions at the end, because I see some of you are somewhat uh, maybe have more questions uh co so co uh, really do a uh, beautiful job what they do is a characterization that is quite we believe uh to be realistic of what are the sort of censorships they do that by explaining the censorships that were or, sorry fact checks common mistake in the debate and now in the oa uh the sort of fact checks that get done why are these the sort of fact checks that they get that, that get done they explain they provide a different characterization of how things go on within twitter but i think more even more importantly they ground their characterization in the reality of the types of decisions that twitter has made so far and then through uh, a logical link that is a logical flow that is significantly simpler to accept, i.e., it requires less assumptions to accept. They explain how those misinformation that misinformation translates into harm, specifically public safety, misinformation and minority, and voter suppression, which is like, by the way, the big ticket item case for for the first Twitter fact check. Uh, and 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 yeah, then then they explain why there is likely that Twitter is balanced in terms of politics, and so therefore fact checks would be restricted to the smallest things. The two reasons, therefore, we think that uh, that CO takes over CG, both of them would actually be sufficient individually, probably, is A, that we find the characterization to be more believable in the face of it. It's more grounded in reality, and a similar level of analytical work is done, so we find it a lot more persuasive. But also do note that even if we were to accept both premises or either premise, after accepting the premise, the amount of uh, persuasiveness that the link that has to follow from that premise, the, the chain that has to follow for that premise, is a lot higher for CO. I.e., what CO require me to believe once I think that Twitter is making big ticket item fact checks, and from that to go on to believing that it's going to be about COVID-19 and, vo and voter suppression, is a very simple chain. To follow the chain from Twitter is going to care about corporate inter interests to Twitter is going to effectively deploy that as a strategy to pursue the advancement of neoliberal policy is not an impossible chain. In fact, it's a possible enough chain to get a second, but it's a more complicated chain than misinformation about COVID kills people. Uh, so that's the rationale. Would love any questions and also feel free to come to me or Anna for feedback. Anna will probably be more available as I have to make this run on time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank uh, is it is it okay uh, to you. message you guys on Facebook? Yes, no problem. Amazing. That's great. Here is